In prayer, we have to direct the, our prayer to the Father in the name of Holy Spirit and through the name of Jesus Christ. And when we pray, we have to have a faith, we have to believe in God, and we should be, we should not doubt, we have to believe. You know, Benji, I just like to share a scripture okay. with you. Okay. It Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. It says, don't worry about anything, but instead, pray about everything. Every time when I pray, I feel so close to God, like I am having a conversation with Him. And you know what? God showed me His answer through all different kind of ways. Almost eight years now, I've been free of cancer. The prayer is so powerful. So, as I said earlier, when you pray, you have to have faith in God. That's how I got uh, healed. When I'm praying before God, when I bring my sorrow and praise to the presence of God, I feel so comforted. I know He's there with me. I have a cousin. He doesn't go to church. He is a gambler. So all my relatives said that, oh, you have to give up on him. I, I don't think he's going to change. But I was persistent. I keep on praying for him. After eight years, finally, he changed and he stopped gambling. He is now active in church. He's now a believer. They keep telling me, quit. He will not change. But I told them, it's not me who's going to change him. It's the Holy Spirit. I got to know a woman. She had a lot of challenges in her life, her personal relationship, her job, and uh, she just such a bitter person. After we got to know her, we invited her to our prayer session. And we're just holding hands and thank God and asking God to guide us. You know what? After two to three years, her whole attitude of life changed. She no longer felt that she has to defend herself against everybody out there. If you have any prayer request, you can send us and we will be praying for you. And uh, it is in the Bible, pray without ceasing. Whether it's good or not good, we still have to pray. And God commanded us to pray one another. So every prayer request, we welcome it. Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Chris Tate, and I'm so happy that you've joined us for worship today. It's my hope and prayer that by being together for this time of worship, that you'll experience God, that you'll be able to come to faith or grow in your faith in Jesus Christ, and that together as the people of God, that we can truly help to make Christ's difference in the world. Here at Glendale First, we try to do that in a multitude of ways, and we do have some upcoming specific opportunities to do that. One is, is that tomorrow on November 8th, on Monday, we're going to be having a Zoom meeting with our missions committee, where we're going to be meeting with another church in the area that does some wonderful and important work with immigrant and refugees here in the Glendale and LA area to help them as they seek to resettle in these communities. And so I encourage you to join us for that. Again, it will be at 7 p.m. over Zoom, and there's more information about it on our website, Glendale first.org for all the information that you may need. Also, today is the second week in our sermon series, Gratitude Grows Generosity, which is functioning as our annual stewardship campaign here at Glendale First 
where we are looking at how as people of God that we are called to use what we have and who we are to help further the work of Christ in the world. And one of the ways that we do that is giving our financial resources to help support the mission and ministry here of the church and also as a faithful act of worship. So because of that, starting next Sunday, we're going to be sending out our commitment cards and a guide for generosity to help to talk about what it looks like to live out financial generosity here at the church. And so uh, be looking for those or also if you don't receive one and you would like to, you can find out that information on our website, glendalefirst.org as well. So with that said, let us pray as we begin to worship. Gracious and loving God, we trust and believe that you are with us wherever we are. And as you know us better than we know ourselves, you know what our struggles, our needs, our fears, our wants, and our desires are. Come to us in this moment and help us to experience you. Help us to experience your healing and your hope, your forgiveness and your joy. And also help us to understand how it is that we can more faithfully follow you and how in doing so that we can help to change this world, to help it to become what you want it to be, where all people are seen and valued and heard and are able to live in loving relationship with one another. Gracious God, speak to us, change us, transform us in this time so that we truly may be a part of your work. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we are in the second week of our sermon series, Gratitude Grows Generosity, which is also serving as our annual stewardship campaign for the year, where all of us who are connected with this church, with Glendale First, have the opportunity, have the, the response, the responsibility uh, to fulfill our commitment to the church to help support the missions and the ministries of this congregation, uh, the work of this body of Christ to help make Christ's difference in the community around us. So as we gather today, we are exploring what is personally one of my favorite scriptures that comes to us from the 25th chapter of Matthew. At this particular point in Jesus' life and ministry, as Matthew tells his story, Jesus is in the final days of his life before his crucifixion. And so as he is gathering with his disciples, with the women, with the other people who have made this journey with him for three years now, and as he has entered the city of Jerusalem, as this time of knowing that he will soon be departing them is at hand, Jesus is shifting the focus of his teachings to help those who are closest to him to know what to do, to know how to live once he is no longer with them. We know about the crucifixion and the resurrection, but even after the resurrection, Jesus is only with them for a short period of time before these closest to him are left with this, this phenomenal responsibility and opportunity to continue the mission of Jesus in the world, which ultimately leads to us being here today. And we remember in that, that we have this same opportunity and responsibility as well. So as Jesus gathers his disciples, as he is teaching them, he tells the story that we have come to know as the parable of the talents. Jesus tells of a master who gathers together three of his servants or slaves, depending on the translation of the Bible that you read. And as he gathers these servants together, it says that he gives to each one of them talents according to their abilities. And what talents are, we in English understand those as being, you know, abilities, uh, gifts, those things that we are good at. But in, in the biblical understanding of them, they are, it's an amount of money. What it specifically means is it's a weight, a weight of silver. And so one talent would be equal to 6,000 days wages or 6,000 denarii. So if we were to equate that to say minimum wage here today in Southern California at $15 an hour, that would be roughly $720,000. If it was an average day's wage for a worker, it would be around $1.2 million. And depending on what you make, it could be significantly more. 
But nevertheless, the point that Jesus is making in this and saying a talent is that Jesus is trying to provoke the hearers of this, that it is a phenomenal amount. And so for one servant to be given five talents, to be trusted with that by their master, the master is giving them a phenomenal opportunity. So Jesus says that the master brings in these three servants and gives to them the first five talents, the second one two talents, and the last one one talent. And each, again, according to their ability. And then it says that the master leaves. And so then the servants find themselves in this place where they have been trusted with this huge sum of money, an amount of money that was well beyond their own ability to acquire or to earn, and they are left to do something with it. The point in what Jesus is communicating in this story is with this amount of wealth that's being trusted to these servants is that it's really an obscene amount. Jesus is using hyperbole here to say that each one of these servants were given a phenomenal opportunity. So then as he continues the story that the master leaves and the servants don't really have any specific instructions about what it is that they're supposed to do with this phenomenal amount of wealth that they never would have been able to earn or have in their own lives that was given to them, that was entrusted to them of what they're to do with it. And so it says that the first one who had the five talents goes out, trades with it, and is able to earn five more talents. The same too for the one who has the two talents goes out, trades with it, and comes back and earns two more talents. So they have 10 and four respectively. But then it says the one who has only the one talent, that, that they were afraid. And because they were afraid, they take this one talent of money and they go and, and they bury it they bury it in the ground. Now, that may seem really strange to us, but in that day and age, in that part of the world, the custom was is that because there weren't banks with vaults like we think of today, that if you were left as being responsible for someone else's wealth, if you buried it in the ground in, in a responsible way, not just out in the middle of the road where people saw you doing it, but really in a safe and secure way, that if you did that and then someone came along and found it and took it, then you weren't responsible for this, that you had fulfilled your, your obligation, your responsibility, and that you wouldn't be liable for what had happened. So in this, the, the servant with the one talent was, was really doing the safest thing possible. And not just the safest, was doing the thing that had the least amount of risk associated with it. And so up some period of time pass, we don't know how long, and eventually the master returns. And as we can imagine, when the master comes back, the master wants to know what has happened, what has been done with what he has left uh, these servants responsible for. And so if we can imagine this, imagine the, the master sitting in, in the main room, in the, the living room or the, the main gathering place in what would have likely been a large, a large home, uh, for a person to have this much wealth. Uh, in my mind, I envision the servants being in the outer waiting area. I can see them in my mind, and most likely the, the two servants who did very well with what was left to them, I can see them both being excited about looking forward to share with the master this great thing that they had done, these great returns they had been able to earn. And yet at the same time, I can see the servant who only able to bring back what was given to him probably not being in the same place. Jesus continues in the same way and says that the first servant comes in who has the five talents who had been able to earn five more presenting 10 and shows them to the master and says, look what I've been able to do. And the servant hears from the master the powerful words of well done, good and faithful servant. The same too for the one who has the two talents comes in and presents it to the master and he receives the same praise. And yet the one who has the one talent comes in and the situation is extremely different. The servant with the one talent comes in and immediately begins saying, you know, master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter seeds. And so I took what you gave me and I hid it in the ground. 
Here you have back what is yours. I'm giving you back to you exactly what you gave it to me. But in this, the response we hear from the master is not one of joy or celebration, but instead let us hear these words again from the scripture. Beginning in verse 26, but his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents, for to all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. For as this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So let's explore what's going on here. Now, is this what's being said in the scripture? Do we think that's literally true about the master? Does it seem like this master is harsh and that he is one that is gathering where he does not scatter, that, that he is sort of this, this vindictive and this uh, really sort of judgmental overseer. My understanding of the scripture and what Jesus is telling to us from this interaction with the servant with the one talent is that because the servant saw the master in this way, that he was afraid and his fear kept him from using this phenomenal opportunity that he had before him. And because of that, he hid what he had in the ground and he gave it back simply as it was without doing anything with it. And because of that, when we get to this last line and he is thrown out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, a line that has troubled me since I was a child and first remember hearing it, my understanding of that is that the person who is weeping and the gnashing of teeth are that of this servant, this one talent servant, because it is in this moment that they realize that they had this phenomenal, really once in a lifetime opportunity and they squandered it and they missed it. What happens with the, the other two servants is that, that it wasn't fear it wasn't fear of the master that, that restricted them, that kept them from living in this way where they didn't use what was given to them, where they didn't have an opportunity. Instead, they went out, they traded with it, and they were able to double. They were able to have this phenomenal return because of it. I believe what Jesus is telling his disciples then and those of us followers of his today is that when we find ourselves in life, when we have these opportunities, if we allow fear to control us, to dictate how we use what we have, we confine and condemn ourselves to these places of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But instead, what Jesus wants for all of us who are his followers is to be able to trust in him, be able to see the opportunities that we have with what we have, with who we are, with what has been entrusted to us, and to not allow fear to control us, where we simply hoard it, where we simply try to control it or bury it because of whatever our fear might be, but instead use it, open ourselves up to it, and allow God to work in and through it, trusting and believing that God will do something great. Early in my life, as I struggled and wrestled with this scripture, I always wondered, well, what if there was a servant? Let's say there was a fourth servant who maybe received three talents, and they went out and traded with them, and they lost them. They didn't double their return, but instead they tried and they did their best, and they lost it. Would they receive praise or condemnation from the master? As I've wrestled with that idea and in my understanding of who Jesus is and who Jesus desires to be for us, what I believe is even in that situation that that servant would receive praise. Because what these servants are praised for is not the rate of return they get, but instead it's their willingness to do. It's their willingness to be brave and to have courage, to not be controlled or condemned by fear, but willing to live. 
And I believe that their return is not simply based on their own uh, business acumen or whatever it may be, but it's because of their openness and their willingness to use this that God is able to work in it and thus the return comes. I believe these are terribly poignant words for us in the life of the church today. So here's the real question for us. As we as followers of Christ that are connected here with Glendale First, as we as so many others find ourselves in this place and time where there is so much to be scared of, where there's so much to cause us to be afraid, with what there is politically in our country, with what there is with the environment, with what there is with the pandemic, with what all churches are facing, uh, with so few people anymore being engaged in actively uh, seeking out communities of faith. When we find ourselves in this time when there are really countless reasons that, that could cause us to be afraid, what do we do? What do we do as a community of faith, as a church? What do we do as individual followers of Christ? In this time of fear, do we take what we have? Do we bury it in the ground and then when we're called to give account of it, simply present it back as it was? Or in these trying times, do we remain strong, courageous, and faithful? being willing to use what we have, what has been entrusted to us, being willing to use it for God and for God's purposes, trusting and believing, being willing to allow God to work in it, and truly believing that God can bring about a return that we likely can't even imagine ourselves. That's the question for us. That's the challenge and the opportunity that Jesus sets before us. May we, as the people of faith, may we, as the people who call Glendale First our home, see that opportunity that we have, and may we respond, not in fear, but truly in faith. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, there is plenty in the world, as there always is, to be scared of to cause us to believe that, that the greatest and the, the best response is, is for us to simply hunker down, to take what we have and to hold on to it tightly waiting for this storm to pass. But as we know from our experience, if we are open and honest with ourselves, that there are always storms. There are always reasons to be afraid. But we put our trust not in those things, but we put our trust in you. And you call us to be people of faith, whose lives aren't dictated and governed by fear, but in loving, faithful response and partnering with you, trusting and believing that no matter what is going on in the world, that you are always at work. And we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be a part of your work by giving of what we have and of who we are to help further that work in the world as an act of worship and faith in you. So we ask that you would help us to be grateful for those opportunities, to be grateful for what we have and to respond in gratitude, to respond with generosity just as you did, being willing to give of your very life. May we give as well to truly be those people that you have called us to be. And as we pray all of these things, gracious God, we also pray together, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Each time we gather for worship, wherever we are, we are reminded of how blessed we are by God. And so it is out of gratitude and with thanksgiving that we give back to God a portion of what we have received. You can do that today by clicking on the link below and going to glendalefirst.org to give online. With that, let us pray. For all that you are and all that you do, we give you thanks, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. We wait in hope for the coming of your realm and offer these gifts to further your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Before we have our benediction, don't forget about the missions meeting that will be coming up tomorrow night on Monday, November 8th, where we'll hear about a wonderful opportunity that we have as a church to be a part of some great work in supporting new people who are coming to this area. And then also uh, stay on the lookout for more information about our annual commitment cards and also our giving guide that's available on our website and many of you will be receiving by mail in the coming week. So with all of that said, may we remember the teachings of Jesus Christ and the calling that he gives all of us to not be afraid, to not allow fear to keep us from living the lives that he calls us to, to use what we have and who we are for his sake, and in doing so that we truly might receive the blessing that he offers. Well done, good and faithful servant. In the name of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer. Amen.